Yes, hello, who is this? Jim, it's Chris. You're going to have to do Trash Movie Bonanza by yourself this week. I have to reform the Ninja Empire. Damn it. Gonna need an extra large coffee for this episode. Jamie, hit it. Trash Movie Bonanza with your hosts, Jim and Chris. Hello, folks. Welcome to, what is this, the uh, fourth episode of Trash Movie Bonanza? I am Chris. I host a show called Comic Tropes, where I analyze comic book history and techniques. And with me, as always, is my buddy, Jim. You want to tell him what you do? What's up, guys? My name is Jim. I draw comic books, art books, and uh, I'm just out there having a good time and watching ninja movies whenever time allows it. Ninja movies. This was your theme, Jim. Great idea because anything exploitation is going to have interesting stuff. And there was definitely an 80s ninja boom here in America. That was an audience. What do you like to look for in a ninja movie in general? Yeah, man, just, um, well, I feel like you and I were probably at the perfect age in the 80s to become exposed to the ninja craze through oh, yeah. these movies on cable TV, which I would sneak up the street where I lived in the suburbs in St. Louis and watch these with a buddy of mine who was the first kid to get cable on our block. That's because so funny. my folks didn't get cable until I was in eighth grade. So they didn't I know. didn't have cable at all. I didn't have cable at all, like growing up until I like got to college. And I did a similar thing where like I met a kid in third grade who had cable and we would just watch pro wrestling and trashy movies. Same for me, man. And then also, uh, I know we have this in common as well, dude, is G.I. Joe hit and mm. the Ninja Turtles as well in, in this area, this sweet spot of like me being 10, 11 when all this is happening and being obsessed with G.I. Joe and Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow and me and my friends, you know, trying to order Ninja nunchucks out of the back catalogs of like inside kung fu magazine and right there was like black it was belt a whole magazine thing. with like yes. dante jones will teach you like you know the the death touch and stuff like that yeah <laughs> so man i i chose for my movie uh revenge of the ninja because this is completely based in nostalgia with me where i, I saw this when i was like too young, like 10 or 11. And it just completely blew my mind. I mean, it was like the most badass thing ever. And if you guys aren't familiar with this, it's, it's a Canon films production, uh, 1983 directed by Sam Furstenberg, which this is a shocking thing, man. This is actually his first action movie. It's pretty well done. I would say it's, yeah. it's fairly professional. Um, sometimes like, you know, we're viewing this through a modern lens and, um, you know, American movies, you see like something like John Wick. Well, it's been heavily influenced through the lens of like now we've seen we've been exposed to 80s and 90s Hong Kong cinema and stuff like that that can like do really well choreographed and well shot scenes. This is definitely a little simpler for like the cinematography and the staging. But it's still professional. And, yeah. and at the time, I agree. Like, it was mind-blowing to see martial arts like this. Yeah. And Chris, the thing I love about this movie is it is no nonsense ass-kicking. I mean, the script yeah. is is fairly tight. It's no nonsense. There's no scene of dialogue or exposition that lasts longer than four minutes, probably. <laughs> and you are just getting the badassery of this brilliant guy, Sho Kazuki, on screen. The The main reason to watch this movie is for Sho Kazuki's brilliant performance. Yeah, he's a very and, charismatic performer. Um, yeah. An actual, like, black belt, uh, real guy, real karate guy. Yes. Uh, and, and he's got a good screen presence. I'm a little surprised, aren't you, that he doesn't have more credits? Like, he had this sort of brief window in the early to mid-80s uh, including like this, 
and then he sort of like he did stuff but he he didn't he didn't rise to you know your your jackie chan type level he he, right. he didn't become that that's a good point to make and the other thing is like you know he he made his debut in enter the ninja which came out in 1981 for from canon films that kind of started the ninja movie craze it really did enter the ninja starred franco nero who is the guy who plays django in the django movies oh, um okay. he's a mustached dude who's like the main character and shokazugi is the bad guy in enter the ninja everyone who saw enter the ninja including the producers were like okay well shokazugi is the obvious star here for yeah. the next ninja movie give him the movie, make him the star, make him the good guy. And as long as we're talking a little bit about the behind the scenes stuff, this formed basically a trilogy of movies at Canon. Cause then they did uh Ninja three, the dominion or domination. I always mess that up. Domination. Domination. Hey, got a, got a guest star today. We, we got uh, a ninja cat in the back. We got a ninja cat back there. Uh, What's crazy about that is then they sort of just, they gave Shoko Sugi the sort of villain role. It was a much smaller role in that one. But yeah, uh, yeah Canon, if that, have you seen that documentary about them? Uh, Electric Boogaloo? Yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. What, like, you know, all things considered, a fairly short lived company, a little on the cheaper side, a little more on the exploitation side. And at the same time, the movies they produced, pretty damn entertaining including oh yeah one. oh yeah and like i said canon knows their audience and like with revenge of the ninja they know they want people want to see ass kicking ninjas weapons boobs violence destruction and and that's what you get with this flick man it's the movie or even five minutes in we've gotten most of the things you just listed yes it Dude, just the starts- movie yeah. <laughs> the movie starts off and in less than three minutes, we basically have a bloodbath in Japan where Shokazugi's family is taken out by an evil clan of ninjas. For the comic um, book nerds out there, it's the Punisher's origin story over in modern day Japan. A little kid gets a, a ninja star to the head. Yeah. Yeah. And dude, as a kid too. watch as as a kid watching this, this kind of freaked me out like how what level of um seriousness it, it it was sort of at right away you know um so shows can you please stop can you... <laughs> I, I love you but come on come on scoot oh dude he's seeing the garfield phone and he's probably like i want to getting... be in the room with this garfield phone he's getting jealous of the garfield phone <laughs> Jim, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted because I've got a guest, but I, I, I do want to talk about this movie. Just go with it and I'll just deal with this. Oh, yeah. Um, so the intro, you know, we're, we're moving very quickly with Sho's family getting murdered. Sho and his American friend, Braden, show up and see the horror of Sho's family being taken out. Um the ninjas are still around. He had around a wife, that- he had kids, he had a dad. Like they're all yeah. they're all dead. Kind of interesting to note that Brayden was allowed to uh just run around with a gun. Uh if you've been to Japan, you know that that's not easy. But whatever. Yeah. You, you got to yeah. <laughs> Brayden just whips out a gun. He and uh his show are ready. We keep calling him Show, but the character's name was uh Cho Osaki. Yes. Very should simple. we do should we do show our Cho for the movie review? Let's just like, call I, him Show Kasugi because he's him, man. Yeah. He plays himself. He's a it, it is him, yeah. And he deserves the glory. Um so right off the bat, we get to see Show's skills. He's taking out these ninjas. Or we have high octane ninja action. Braden, we don't know about his ninja skills yet. He's shooting ninjas. Um, One of my least favorite things I will say within ninja stuff is as soon as you bring in a gun, it sort of, it levels the playing field too much. I, I want to see martial arts. So you, I, I like to see good excuses for, for guns getting like, just like knocked out of people's hands and stuff like that in a martial arts movie. But my favorite part of this fight, like the only one I have to comment on is, uh, yeah, show actually catches a, an arrow with his teeth. Yes. 
that that's the level of of skill that he's at great sequence too you know and oh i have to mention uh shokazugi did most of the fight choreography on this movie i mean it was him choreographing this stuff planning it he even provided some of his own wardrobe and some of the weaponry so you could tell that he knew this movie was his big moment this was his i think you're right i think you're to right shine. yeah and, and he and he made it he made the most of it he did he does a really good job playing like you know a stoic but conflicted and complicated man i like yes it. yeah so after show defeats these ninjas his mother is there and they recover show's baby whose name is kane and he's real the, life son also yes. named kane and he's the him and Sho's mom are the sole survivors. Excuse me, sole survivors of this confrontation. And Braden basically tells Sho that him and his family need to move to America. They need to get out of Japan. Right um, now, Chris, real quick, the script doesn't have time to explain this to us, which I respect because it's this type of movie. But in my mind, I've made up my own mythology of shows family in japan for generations has had conflict with this evil ninja clan because he mentions that his father and his grandfather both died on this soil americans are going crazy over japanese art now i'll put all the money in and you run the place sorry but i must stay in japan my father my grandfather were killed fighting on this land right so I kind of, like I said, I kind of dig this because the script is like, you don't need to worry about the history. Don't worry. We're heading to America now. The shit is going to continue to hit the fan. We we don't have time for this. So I like let's that, just... but I also like the thought that like, Sho is the first one in three generations to have had family die on that soil. And he's the first one to be like, well, maybe I ought to change it up and move. Like yeah. the, His father and grandfather both died and the family was like, yeah, what can you do? Yeah, I, I, exactly. It, 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 well. Don't Chris, think about it too much. This is not the I was, kind of I was movie make, you're allowed I was to gonna, think about much. I was going to make a joke and be like, you know, it took the the white man, the white friend to be like, you got to get the hell out of like, screw family in your land. You got to get the hell out of here. Come I mean, to he America, baby. he is resistant baby. to it. He is resistant. Yeah. He's like, no, no, no. And, and he's, and, and the friend is like, no, you'll come run a, a gallery with me. I'm like, you're running around with a gun in japan but you run an art gallery I, I we should have been more suspicious of brayden from the jump you have a son you want him caught up in all this bloodshed come with me my son's place is here you see this his father died on this land this soil is sacred with our family blood do you want to see your son dead and your grandson too I'm offering him a great fortune in America, a new life. Things move fast. We cut to six years later and we're in Los Angeles. And Kane uh, has grown up a little bit. And we see Shokazugi's son, Kane, grown up and being harassed by uh, school bullies. Not just and bullies, we, multicultural bullies. Yeah. This is like a rainbow coalition of diversity as far as bullies go. Everybody was represented. Excellent point. These are 80s elementary school movie bullies. Chris. Every 80s gang was yeah. a vi very diverse gang. That was how it was portrayed every time. Yeah. And we get to see little Kane kick some ass. Like he's... Yeah, it's fun. It's in the family. It's in the blood. He's got the ninja training. Um, What's funny, Jim, is that the, the scene isn't like he throws one or two punches and the bullies are scared off. It's, it's a full fight scene. And I was like, these yes. bullies are very motivated bullies. Yeah. Like they just keep going for a while until they yeah. finally have had enough. And and Kane takes some hits too. I mean, he's not a perfect fighter. So it it, it is this whole thing of like um which oh, I you're like. getting you're I, getting I, the full spectrum of of these kids and and you know some of them are fighting dirty and yeah. you know it's um show appears and kind of grabs his son and is like, what did I tell you? No fighting in America. We've no left behind 
the ninja ways and grandma shows up and is like, no, I'm here to remind you that you should be training your son in the family way and, and in the secrets of the ninja. She has a fantastic line. Jamie, please include this. You must teach him the way of the ninja. And then she's got this jewelry that she got on like timu.com. I did not bring him here to America to fight in the streets with fools. Joe, it does not matter where you raise him. You must teach him the way of the ninja. It's the family tradition. This bears the sign of our family. And when I die, it will be yours. It's like their family crest, like this, this a crane crane. And it even shows up later on shows ninja outfit. It's like their family, yeah. which means he had to go to the trouble of finding like, you know, an embroiderer or something it was like, this is my yeah. family ninja uh, emblem. And I need you to put it, you know, here on my black ninja suit. Totally. Yeah, man. It, so we have a great setup of where show and his son and that their family is, um, and we kind of cut to them next in the dojo of the art gallery right. gallery where show is explaining to Kane that their new business is importing these Japanese dolls. Sure. His sword has been fused shut with like a garbage bag twisty tie. <laughs> it is you know, much. you know what I'm saying? It's like and, yeah. and, and, and he won't break the seal because he's not gonna fight anymore. Yeah. They've left their ways behind, but it they're still training to honor tradition. And it's, hey, you know. it's good exercise, right? Yeah. And this is another excuse for Shokazugi to, to kind of like show off his son's abilities. His son is doing these sword exercises and it, it's impressive. Like the kid knows what he's doing. It, it's cool. Clearly. Clearly. And he's acrobatic too. The, the, this is the, the hallmark of a ninja movie versus just a martial arts movie is a lot of acrobatics for no reason. People yes. doing backflips and somersaults. This has a little bit of it. Not as much yeah. as the next one, but a little bit of it. Kane does looks, a backflip, I think. Right. And and you're right, man. And it looks cool on film. So that's why it looks great. it's there. Who cares? Yeah. <clears throat> so Is this when we got introduced to um, the sort of love interest? Kathy shows up. This Kathy. blonde woman in her red karate gi with no pants. And uh, she makes a point of saying that. Yeah. And you, and I, I, I think Jamie should include that line too. I just want you to teach me the way. Well, if you want to work out, you forgot your pants. You really think I forgot? Yeah. And he, so she kind of sends Kane on her way. And then we learn that she is tied in with show's business. She's kind of like helping him out. And then we she's have this the assistant to Braden, basically. I think that like, you know, essentially like back then it would have been a, called a secretary. It's like an admin assistant or something. And, you know, Braden gives her special responsibilities, but I'm pretty sure that that's her actual paid job. Yes. Yeah. And, and it seems like show makes a comment of like, Oh, I wish I was paying you. And she, basically comes on to him. She tries to seduce oh, yeah. him. And that's where we got get him saying like, oh, you forgot your pants. And she's kind of like, I didn't you forget. I this forgot. Was. So, but Sho is not interested in this nonsense. And, 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 and you know, that, that sort of speaks though to like a bigger thing. Like Asian men in American movies, like, were sexless for the longest yep. time. Yep. Like she came on to him, but I'm pretty sure that they never really kiss or anything like that. You know, they, no. they don't have like a, a sex scene. It's like, it's hinted that that's a love interest and he cares about her, but it, it, it was just a, and, and it's, it struck me as kind of odd, like that it didn't get, like move forward or progress as a, like a, a, a romance. Like it, it, it just sort of ignores that, that as a subplot. Right. Which was just, I guess, a product of the time. Do you also think that Sho wanted to portray his character as his wife was murdered in Japan? He's you could argue it. such a strict, disciplined, stoic guy. He's not going to mess around with any of these uh, American women while he's in L.A. 
Maybe, maybe I'm reading. I'm reading into it again. I'm creating my own mythology for it, but it works. It, it certainly what you're describing works. Yeah, but yeah, we're so, dealing with the with the dolls, which is, I I gotta say, a very strange business to have gotten into because I've been to Japan many times. I I, I I'm sure that they do make dolls. I've yeah. never really taken notice of them as an important cultural export. Right. But Chris, would you agree that the whole reason it's a doll and not a painting is because these dolls are the MacGuffin of Braden is using them to transport heroin. So we see Kane break one of the dolls and heroin spills out of it. Which Kane is is naive enough to not understand and, and right. he doesn't really react to that. But they never really get into like how that works. And and because towards the end of the movie, all of a sudden I thought, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I get that you could h physically hide heroin in these dolls, but how does that get through customs? They've got like drug sniffing dogs and things like that. Like it, they're, that's never addressed. It's just that like, I and I don't know why Braden needed Cho for this because who's putting together these dolls over in Japan? That's right. also never addressed. So you can't look too far into the bad guy's plan in this movie. Yes. It really falls apart with like even the tiniest bit of scrutiny. That's not why we're here, I guess. But yes, Braden is smuggling drugs is the important through line that we that we learned. So here's another thing, Chris. So we're introduced to this Italian gangster named Cafano. Yeah. And my understanding rewatching at this time was like, okay, so Braden is importing these dolls filled with her heroin from Japan. And then he's selling them to Cafano, the Italian gangster. Um, yes. But, but Cafano again, isn't like paying up on time. Yes. But again, you can't ask too many questions because it's like, can't Braden just find heroin in LA? He's in LA. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. So. Like why would heroin, <laughs> her, like if this was coming from China that has opium fields, okay, that makes sense. Japan is not really known for manufacturing heroin. So I right. don't get that at all. It's also funny that there's this huge Italian sort of gangster organization when this movie is clearly shot in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> like yes. It is in the middle of nowhere. And I only say clearly because there are a lot of shots of the mountains behind the city. Yep. So yep. it's, it's, it's not New York City. It's not L.A. Right. It's not Chicago. It's not one of these big cities that has crime problems. We're in the yeah. middle of nowhere. That was cracking me up watching it this time, man, was like all the beautiful snow-capped mountains in <laughs> Los Angeles. In the background of every street shot, it's like there's no palm trees, there's there's, but there's gorgeous mountain landscapes. You know? So, you know, like if, I guess it wasn't too hard for either Braden or Caifano to become these uh, crime lords in the middle of nowhere. Right. And dude, I love Caifano and his Italian stereotype. Oh. mobster gang. They're... I thought of him as knockoff Joe Pesci. Deal was, I get the money the minute the dolls are here. A few more days ain't gonna make no difference. A big difference. They want the rest of the money today in cash. Now, what am I supposed to tell them? How about, uh, how about Van Gogh? <laughs> Capiche? They're, they're awesome, and, and, and they are completely like 1980s action movie Italian gangster stereotypes. Caifano's so. nephew is wearing like the stereotypical sort of um, uh, suit, you know, tailored suit top, but blue jeans for the bottom. <laughs> I was like, yeah. that doesn't strike me as like Italian gangster, but it does strike me as 1980s. It's wild, man. And so... Um, Braden this is where and, we learn that Braden is is also a ninja, right? Yes, because Braden and Cafano have a conflict over the payment, right? And boom, dude, we we cut to Braden loading up a suitcase of ninja weapons, and now he's like a supervillain where he's transforming into a silver metal masked ninja and taking out Cafano's. Henchmen, basically. I liked his look. 
And I like that he wore that silver sort of Oni mask because it differentiated him from, you know, eventually the good guy and stuff like that. And no matter what, it just looked cool. It was a, it was yes. a good look. It looked honestly like, you know, a Marvel supervillain or something. It was a good look for, for a movie like this. Definitely, man. And, you know, as a kid, this gave me almost like Destro vibes from G.I. Oh, Joe. good. Yeah, totally. Totally. You know, where, because as a kid, I didn't know what like an Oni mask was. I didn't right. know anything about Japanese tradition or no. art. So to me, it, it being a comic book nerd, it, it had these super villain, almost like comic, uh, uh, you know, I, ideas behind it of the visual. So not a Again, lick man. of Japanese spoken in this film, by the way, folks. Not right. not like so much as like an arigato. There, there's it's all English, so don't worry. You yes. can enjoy this movie. <laughs> this was made for America, baby. Yes, it was. Um, and Is this uh, where, uh, you tell me. Like I, th- I think I remember what happened next. So, real quick, I'll go through it. Uh, we have a mob informant That's who gets murdered. A homeless um, guy with, with an eye patch. And I was yes. like, that's a mob informant? Oh, okay. Just on the streets in public. Yeah, it was decent. And then, af- and then after that, Chris, we get the, um, I have in my notes, I have it called, uh, I have it labeled, the sexy hot tub murder. Yes. Where the a dude and a girl, and this is when I'm a little kid and I'm watching it and I'm like, oh shit, like, oh, naked girl. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. me and my buddy are like, Hope your mom doesn't come in to like rewind that us, part, you know, and completely. And, um, but yeah, that, so, that's Caifano's nephew. That's why that would be a big deal. Yes. So, so and, the, yeah, Braden the ninja kills, kills them too. And then, man, right after that, we get introduced to, I guess he's the main cop guy, well, the lieutenant guy who, at the crime scene, at the murder scene of the nephew, Cafano shows up and we see that him and the lieutenant know each other. And the lieutenant's kind of like, what's going on? What is this the beginning of a mob war? You got to let me know. And Cafano's basically like, screw you. I don't know anything, you know. 30 minutes um, into this movie, like basically a full third. I mean, I guess you could technically say this is the end of the first act, but it's pretty late in the movie to be introduced. There's, there's the cop and then the cop gets introduced to the um, the karate teacher guy, the American karate guy. Yeah, Keith Vitale. Who Keith is, Vitale. Who was like a world championship actual like martial arts badass. You can tell he he knows his stuff. It is kind of funny when the, the cop goes to sort of like, you know, introduce him. He's just f- teaching his students in this like hallway. It's not even a yeah. gym. It's just this yeah. hallway in some building. I was like, wait, what's going on here? Yeah. And you know, man, I'll give props to Keith Vitale. Um, his character's named Dave. He's obviously not a great actor, but yeah. like he he's serviceable for the movie. And He's a likable presence. He's yes. likable. He's not annoying. And you know, his whole reason for being there is because he can kick ass and look good on screen in real life. That's the reason. But in the movie, the reason is that the cop is like showing him x-rays of broken bones. And he's like, you know, like we can't figure out what did this. And he's like, only a guy who studied karate his whole life could break bones this way. I was like, that's not true, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. This was big. This was Keith's big uh, acting scene where he had to respond to uh, more than two lines of dialogue. But again, man, the the joy of this movie is it's like the scene is not going to last for more than three minutes. Like we've got ninjas, no. we've got ass kicking. Let's move this along. Let's just it, it, keep it, this thing going. Yeah, you know? like there are, at this point in the movie, there's 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 a few tiny exposition scenes and stuff. None of that's really important enough that we need to address it, in my opinion. We can get to like the next time Caifano just sends a group of henchmen to beat up show. Yeah. Yeah. It it and uh including uh including a, a, a Native American prominently. Yes. Yeah. It, that uh again is like 
movie thug uh, uh, guys that, by the way, I mean, doesn't take a genius to figure that out, this out, but all the dudes in that scene, all professional stuntmen, obviously. Oh, clearly. This, this whole scene is just based around awesome, ridiculous stunts. They're and- selling every punch, like flipping over cars and like, you know, hitting the ground hard and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's hilarious. My favorite moment, though, and, and Jamie, I'll give you the time code for this is when that uh, Native American uh, gangster does the slow-mo jump off of the second yeah. or third story with a crate, smashes a crate over Show's head from like three stories up, doesn't even phase the guy. Right. But this is so awesome, man, because it is, again, it's showcasing Show Kazuki. And in this scene he's just this completely unstoppable badass they yeah. beat the shit out of him he beats the shit out of them they jump in their van to escape with his dolls he chases down the van he flips and lands on top of the van's roof he smashes through the windshield there's a fight Great. in the van there's a fight back on the street he gets dragged by the 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 uh or show like gets thrown out the back of the van and he's like hanging on like indiana jones style the only thing is he's getting dragged dick down on the street at like 30 miles an hour. And I was like, good Lord, this guy's yes. Tough. Yeah. And dude, to the point where Shokazugi takes a tomahawk to the chest yeah. from the native American dude and just keeps kicking ass, you know, it, and, and there, he's there are, dodging it, bullets. Yeah. It's, it's that was good. Amazing. actually Rolling out of the way of like bullets at close range. I was like, that's kind of cool. It was a good scene. It was a really good long scene i will say you can tell if you look at it somewhat critically and that i was because we're watching martial arts movies this week there are some moments again i'll give jamie the time code here where there's some awkward pauses in the fight scene because like the second thug or something is like ready to punch but sort of like pauses so that he can get kicked by cho this is stuff that like we would cover up with modern editing and stuff like that but whatever it's yeah. still an impressive athletic display all around. Yeah, completely. It and is it's all real, man. you know, we, we didn't have anything digital. So like when Cho is say jumping through the front windshield of the van. Yeah. I mean like, right. That's, that's movie glass, but it still looks incredible. Yes. Yeah. It was great. It's dude. It, it, like I said, I, this I'll scene, say that's the, probably the second best scene after maybe the final fight or something. Yeah. And, and, it, and uh, you know, it, the thugs wind up getting away. And then we have um, one of my personal favorite scenes, Chris, Grandma versus Brayden. I was uh, a little surprised. That one definitely doesn't do as good a job hiding the stunt devil because Grandma does some backflips. We're showing that clip for sure. Dude, this is something, this is almost like straight out of Naked Gun. Yeah. It's. Braden has snuck into the dojo for some reason, fights Granny. Does he kill her? Yeah, he kills yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- and shoves the, the the sword through the sort of a paper wall that she's hiding yeah. in. And Kane sees this and then Braden goes after Kane, but There's a little chase scene there that's almost home alone-esque. Not quite. It doesn't quite get funny, but it's a, it's right on the edge. Yeah. And dude, it's cool though, because that's like Kane is too quick and small and, and he's able to kind of, you know, like out Fox Braden. And, uh, yeah, I liked it. He's freaked he's out scrambling and takes around. off. And we see, um, 
Sho returns to the dojo and we see that he discovers his mother is dead and, you know, he takes the uh, necklace with their, you know, family symbol on it. And you know that it's going to be like, here's where the revenge of the ninja part comes in, you know? Right. But the only thing that undercut that a little for me, Jim, is that um, that's an emotional moment. And then there is this, one of the hardest cuts I've seen in editing, it just cuts to one of Brayden's henchmen starting to um, assault Kathy. Oh yeah. It's, it, yeah. it, it's tonally and it, it, like just, just this hard cut. It just in media res, this big fat guy is, is trying to, you know, essay this woman. And, and I yes. was just like, wow, didn't give us a moment to breathe on that emotional beat, but okay. Right. It, um, and then as that's happening, Braden comes back right. in the, in the ninja outfit and kills that. Henchman. Kills the guy. That's fine. Uh, and then we get a little bit of like the mystical ninja stuff because he hypnotizes Kathy. Yes. I love this. With glowing yeah. eyes. Kathy, little Kane saw me. Find him and bring him here to me. No, not Kane. Please. Kathy, count with me. Two. One. Now go and get him. Yeah. Dude, as a as a kid, I was like, holy shit. Like he has he has powers. He has... I think that ninjas need a little bit of that, because otherwise you yeah. can just do like martial arts. But ninjas should have like this. I like them to have both crazy weapons and a little bit of mysticism. Yes, bit. I agree. I agree. You gotta have the balance. And um after this scene, man, this cracks me up, but I know. Dave, Dave and show go to confront some village people. Ex-cons I have the exact in the park. same note. And they're and the village I, people. That had to be it, intentional, right? Uh, yes. Because yeah. it is like four guys that are completely dressed like, you know, I don't know if it was the cop, but they definitely had the construction guy and, you know, like the Native American the cowboy, guy, the cowboy. Yeah. It's the yeah. village people. Although they are, for some reason, hanging out at a little children's playground. I know. Because that's as, where they wanted the fight scene to happen. As thugs do, you know. It, uh, but this was another... What this kind whole of information scene, were they going to get from them, by the way? I, I don't know. I don't uh, know either. Dave makes a comment while Sho is paying tribute to his mother in the temple where he's like... I have a lead on some ex thugs, right. ex cons that might have information. Nothing That's happens. All that's it's said. just a, it's a cool fight scene. Don't get me wrong, but I was a little confused as to what the point of that scene was. Yeah, it's just to showcase more of shows skills and 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 Dave. You know, he gets to kick ass as yeah, well. Yeah, it's good. Um, and then you know after that we have. What, Kane what action versus, fans want. This is what action fans want. Dude, Kane, little Kane versus Kathy, hypnotized Kathy. Yeah. Uh, and that's a whole other thing. And and Kane has the opportunity basically to like take Kathy out or, or hurt her or murder her with this staff with a dagger on the end. And then right. he decides he can't do it. And then Kathy just sort of easily grabs him and kidnaps him. Yep. So we see that Kane is now captured by Braden. That felt uh, to me a little bit like um, if you see a guy like uh, The Rock or Vin Diesel in movies today, they actually have waivers in their contract where they can't lose a fight. So if you watch a movie like Black Adam, he has to get captured at one point by um, by the government and Black Adam just has no problem defeating this whole superhero team. And then he just voluntarily gives himself up to <laughs> this felt like that. Like Kane okay. just, Kane okay. just kicked ass. He can't lose, you know, he cannot look weak. And then he just sort of gives up. Yeah. And it, and he does because the script needs that to happen That's at this all moment. It is. That's all it is. You know, and, 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 you know, we, um, 
Kathy we're moving into snaps the out game. of it. Yeah. K- Kathy snaps out of it, calls show and lets him know exactly what's happening. She right. lets him know she messed up. Kane is now in, you know, the, a, a prisoner a of brains. I was just going to say, can I just like, um, when, when Kathy tells Cho about this and, 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 and Cho also talks to Dave and stuff like that, some great lines, like at first, and I'll have Jamie play these. Raiden? Yes. He's a ninja. He betrayed me. Impossible. He's an American. Not impossible. And then the second, I mean, this is the line of the movie for me. Cho just says, only a ninja can stop a ninja. Yes. And dude, that line, that or only a ninja can kill a ninja became part of this ninja trilogy at canon because they repeat it and, they, and the whole idea in Ninja 3, the domination as well. It's so where it's cool like, though. Only a ninja can stop another ninja man. Cops, everyone else, back the hell off. Let these ninjas fight it out. And that's that's what happens. I mean, we get our final confrontation oh but before that i do have to make a note of we get an awesome thing of like Braden and show showing up at the building where kafano's gang is is oh, right. based at right and we see them taking out different members of the gang they each Chris- sneak into the building as ninjas yes we, yeah that, that was actually kind of cool the the rappelling across the the buildings it was I awesome. like that. That was Brady, yeah. right? That did it that way, yes. or was that? Yeah, it was cool. Yep. And Sho uses the climbing claws on his hands and feet to scale the building. I liked it, um, dude. This was something I didn't notice before, but I, I, it, it, it stuck out to me in this viewing. Is I, I thought Cafano had an obvious on-screen death. And he doesn't. He takes a machine gun and starts shooting out of a room that he's in at right. Braden. Braden throws a knife. We see it stick into Cafano's hand and he screams. Right. And that's the last we see of Cafano in the movie. Oh my God, you're totally right. I, I that that that's so that seems like such an oversight to not take yes. him out. Yeah, I I thought I mean it's so obvious that you're he right. would have a dramatic, satisfying death by Braden, and it just isn't it's like they forgot to shoot this important thing i think that 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 the final sort of showdown here i suspect that they may have been on limited time because there are some strange decisions i see here whereas the rest of it is very solid for instance when when Braden has to like you know repel between buildings he has to hook his rope up to something and there's clearly like nothing to hook it onto. He hooks it onto this flimsy little light socket because it, it, it was just there. And when yes. and when Sho is trying to sneak into the building, he is hiding behind the world's tiniest bush, like just a couple like inches <laughs> away from like a guy that walks by. I mean, this bush is probably tinier than Kathy's. This is just this tiny <laughs> little. <laughs> Kathy, well by the played, way, is sir. in well a uh, spa death trap during all of this. So that's our ticking clock is that she's got to like get saved before she drowns. Right, right. That's sort of our ticking clock. You got to have something like that while the bad guys, you know, like if the good guy wins, can he still win in time to save? That's the right. Anyway, that's right. But yeah, the, the hiding behind the bush was one of my favorites. So I just feel like that may have been rushed a little, like that there were some strange decisions being made right at the very end. Yeah. One thing they did spend time on, man, that I really appreciated is the dramatic buildup of when we finally see Sho and Braden mm-hmm. in their ninja outfits. Yeah. And um, on the roof, you're saying? And yeah, yeah. Or, or and they, just getting ready. Well, I, I was going to catch myself because one dramatic, incredible, epic scene of this is actually Sho Kazugi in the temple preparing his weapons and we get in a bit of mysticism. And when we finally see him like put on the ninja mask, he's fully revenge of the ninja. Now it is a dramatic action movie, like epic moment. It's cool. Yeah. I don't 
really remember the music, but I know that it served the scene. It was that 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 was all definitely edited well. It's building up. You know that there's a big confrontation coming, and yes. it's it. You can't really recap fight scenes like on a show like this, but I liked the final fight. I, Me I too. It, it it wasn't that it was even doing sort of like stunt work that I hadn't per se seen before, but I, 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 I believed in everything that was happening. Uh, you know, it's a, it's on a building top. It, it feels like they could fall or something like that. It's in a risky location. Um, it looks good. You know, it's, it's well shot and clear. There are those weird Utah mountaintops everywhere yes. in the background, but right. it was, it was a good final scene where there were stakes, you know, like show, had to, you know, defeat this guy that had betrayed him. He had to save the girl and his son. And his uh, Dave did like break into the building and, and get himself like killed by a ninja during that that whole like. Uh, yes, we forgot so, to mention that. So he Dave, needed a little bit of revenge there too, a measure. Dave of does get taken out by Braden and um, maybe him not and given Joe him. Have, him and Show have a final kind of moment together and. Um, but, oh, dude, what I was going to say real quick was the thing I – going back to mm. the beginning of the battle, the two of them see each other. They do their dramatic like flips through the air and land on a tennis court. That and was we funny. Have a, we have a cool ninja kind of mystic moment where they take the time to like bow, get on their knees, and they're doing like the ninja – like hands and stuff like, like that. St- like Jamie, like you a, can superimpose a, a ninja mask. Yeah. A ninja mask on me right now, but it's, it's and, like, and, and as long as you've got it, Jamie, put that same ninja mask on me. I, I'm a ninja too. <laughs> <laughs> we make him do so much. So, so you have that and you're like, Oh shit. And then boom, the action starts. And Chris, I don't know if you noticed this, but we, I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to point this out as well, but oh. during the rooftop fight, yeah. Braden, it's not explained, but there's like robot versions of him on the roof of this building that pop out. Two. Yeah. There's Shou- one that's K- like Kazugi grabs show around the corner of like, you know, an, uh, what do you call them? Like an industrial fan or something. Yeah. Show slices it in half. It's a dummy. Later, yeah. he walks by like a spa that's bubbling and an arm grabs him. He slices it. It's a robot arm. I was going to say, Braden has better ninja tricks. Show is the better fighter. And he fights, you know, kind of honest and stuff. He's he's yes. a, he's an honorable ninja, but but Braden does have a lot of cool little tricks up his sleeve. Dude, towards the end of the fight, Braden has like a flamethrower in the in, in the, the sword, right? In in, in in the sword or either like up his oh, it was up, up his, his sleeve. sleeve. Yeah, yeah. He just had a flamethrower, <laughs> like Boba Fett. He just like has yeah. like a flamethrower. That's right, like a little. It was cool. I liked some of that stuff. Um, I also was a little confused at one point. Uh, like Cho has lost a sword and he has to fight with the sword sheath, but he still has a sword on his back the whole time. I was like, get your actual sword. Stop fighting with the sheath. Whatever. I noticed that too. Yeah. You have to just go, go with it. Uh, yeah. But it was a good fight. It's a good fight. It, it was a it great takes a while. And, it moves locations across. It it uses every square inch of that roof. Yes. And and we finally see, you know, show takes Braden out and we get a nice glorious shot of gore where, you know, Braden just gets his own sword stuck into his stomach and that's it for him. The, his mask gets sliced in half. Yeah. We see his face. We see him hit the ground, and there's this great shot of Show kind of backing up, and Braden's on the rooftop, and there's just blood everywhere. It's just, Braden it, it, must it, have had incredible blood pressure because yes, he spouts a geyser. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's because, like straight out of a kung fu like yeah. flick, like, like the know, Shaw like Brothers Kong. 1970s stuff. I- Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and then we see. I guess Kane Kathy must have res- and- rescued Kane, Kathy, right? 
Yes. Because uh, all of a sudden they just show up. And the only thing I'll say to that is show where were your priorities. His priority was all about getting revenge on Braden versus finding his missing son. <laughs> he yeah. just trusted his son to take care of things, I guess. He's a like, little my, weird. My son's eight years old. He's had ninja training. He'll be fine. Um, but we do get, we do get, you know, Kane and show reuniting at the end of the movie and in, in mm -hmm. uh, one second, Kathy and show acknowledge each other. Yeah. And then dude, boom, we're, we got the credits and we're, we're done. It, it ended, but I, I wouldn't necessarily call it abrupt. Everything that needed to be resolved had been resolved. And, That's and, true. and they cut to, to credits like in a reasonable amount of time. And I only bring that up because when we get to the end of my movie, it's the most abrupt ending in cinema history. It's amazing. My choice for a movie this week was 1985's Ninja Terminator. Ninja Terminator. Uh, I have had interest in doing a movie directed by Godfrey Ho on this show. Yeah. Do you know much about him? Do you know at least a little about who he who he was? Not really, but I do learning about his technique of making That's movies. all I'm talking about. Okay, lay, lay it on us, man. Godfrey Ho was technically <laughs> a writer-director in Hong Kong, but what he would do is he was working with this company called IDF. They would license existing action movies instead of just showing those they would film the bare minimum of new footage to create a new story for an additional market. In this specific case, even though it was being made in Hong Kong, Godfrey Ho would put white guys and ninjas. He made dozens of these things, dozens, mm -hmm. and it was for the American market. Right. So while this movie is ostensibly about a ninja master with the unlikely name of Harry, <laughs> Harry McQueen, a 50-something white guy with a big bushy mustache played by Richard Harrison, king of the B and Z movies. Yep. More than 50% of this movie is actually footage from a South Korean action movie that was made the previous year called The Uninvited Guest of Star Fairy. And it's pretty damn obvious when you know that which parts are which. Yep. Because yep. if it's a ninja or a white guy, first of all, not a lot of this movie, even though they're the main characters. And if it's anybody else, that's South Korea. Right. It's very obvious. It's, it's uh, so weird. It, the, the gist of what's important is there's an evil ninja empire. And the supreme ninja, that's all he's known as, the supreme ninja. Master, everything is prepared for you. <laughs> Greetings to our master. master. <laughs> Has his three best ninjas bring him pieces of, it looks like a little goblin toy, but it's mm -hmm. like, it's a statue that they call the Golden Ninja Warrior. And if you own it, you are impervious to harm in like the body and the arms. That, that It's three pieces. Yep. By the way, I don't know about you, Jim. The version of this film that I saw was cropped, not widescreen, was cropped. And, and so there were yeah. lots of scenes where important stuff was happening off camera. I, I know, man. I know. And, and starting off, like the very first thing, there's a piece of the statue put down, but all you can see is like the tiniest little bit of like a hand with like a sword handle. And you're yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> I know. I couldn't find like a proper widescreen version of this, like the proper ratio. No, no version. Um, I don't know if it exists, to be honest. I really don't like this don't would know. have been released on VHS in a time where they did not do widescreen. So it may never have been transferred to widescreen. Yeah, dude. So I, I had never seen this movie before. And, and I made a note of like, this movie is like a psychotic ninja fever dream mixed with Benny Hill and like Tim and Eric or something. It, yeah, it is. It's, it's great that we did this as a double feature because I feel like revenge of the ninja is fairly straightforward, clean, tight. 
it edited. establishes the ninja movie tropes. And then this one is the cheapy exploitation knockoff of all of those ideas. Completely, but also mixed with almost like an art school experimentation oh because God, it's yes. so oddly chopped together. The tone um, is always all over the place. Sometimes it's a little funny. Sometimes it's a little like sort of light, goofy action where like, you know, the the henchmen are sort of bumbling buffoons that are going like, ow, and other times it's just flat out violent. And yeah. then the ninja stuff is just like, they're supernatural. The ninjas are supernatural. But yeah. the weirdest thing about this movie is that Harry is one of those three ninjas. Another white guy, um, what was it? Baron is the second. And then there's a, a, a Japanese ninja, thank goodness, uh, Tamashi. However, these three guys decide to steal the statue and run away from the ninja compound. They, they, they're, they're worried, I guess. They don't, they never say this, but they're, they're worried that the Supreme Ninja would have too much power. Master, the Golden Ninja Warrior is gone. What's that? Who did it? Harry, Baron, and Tomashi. They killed all the gods and they got away. Spread the news. Get the Golden Ninja Warrior back. As for the traitors, make sure they're killed. Yes, Master. Mm-hmm. Yep. And while we're told that that's, this is Japan, as somebody who's been to um, various parts of Asia, I can tell you it's very clearly not shot in Japan. It's clearly shot in Hong Kong because even though they're in this ninja compound, if you look in the background, there's mountains and high-rise apartment buildings, modern high-rise apartment buildings. So this ninja compound is not far removed in the woods or anything like that. Yeah. It's just downtown. It's just downtown. It's not, it, it's not in an ancient idealistic like japanese uh, no. old old country or anything you know and there's some fun ninja fight stuff here some acrobatic stuff a lot of pointless cartwheels yes which a lot of the footage is not only is it edited so oddly but a lot of it is sped up it's sped up which is definitely a uh, hong kong thing in action movies um, yeah. But usually they're a little better at covering that up because they don't mm -hmm. speed everything up. They'll speed up like but dude, it, a hit. It, it do, to me, it does create this almost like otherworldly feel to the whole movie where it's like, this movie doesn't exist in the real world. It exists in no. this weird world of Ninja Terminator. Yeah. Which I, I like that. I think that's cool. That's you know? fair. It's a relatively brief scene, and then we're just told that we're jumping forward in time. We go, we're told we're go that, that we go to um, Japan, and um, Tamashi ha has been killed. Pieces of metal in his back. It definitely means somebody wanted him dead. It's so strange. Come, Machiko. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. But I have to find out what happened. For Tomashi's sake. By by um by someone. I don't think we really are told quite yet. Like it's this is a very confusing movie for who works for who. Yes. Because yeah. it's got the Hong Kong footage and the South Korean footage. And most of the movie is those South Korean actors and stuff, but we're all told that they work for somebody from the Hong Kong footage. None of these characters ever meet. Right. So it gets a little confusing. There's tons of subplots. I, I, I don't want to even cover them all. I want to cover some 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 important moments. Um, there's a guy named Tiger Chan that reports to Baron. Baron now runs a criminal empire. Yep. Tiger Chan is pretty entertaining because he's got the blonde hair. That wig, dude, is that's straight I, out of like a bizarre anime or yeah. something. Yeah. You know, like, um, like the pageantry of his character and his outfit and the wig decision. It's like, what is, what is this dude about? You I know. know. And, there, <laughs> and and all of this is dubbed folks. So that's how they could change up the language. It looks a little weird when like Harry talks and it's English, but it doesn't match, but it's so that they could have scenes like, for instance, Tamashi has been killed basically off screen and he's got a brother and a sister that are in mourning and they can do an exposition dump going like, don't be sad, Machiko. <laughs> yes. Michiko and I Ikashi? Ikaza. But I Ikaza, Ikaza is killed right. by some thugs right away. The weird thing that, is that all right. the thugs we are told 
work for, you know, one aspect or another of like uh, a ninja group. But the thugs are always just guys. Yes. Very little ninjas in this movie, right? Yeah. Very That's little. That's what it, it has more of a Hong Kong action flick than it does like an actual ninja even though it was made in south korea yes like it definitely feels more like if you watched 80s hong kong action movies that's how it's shot and and that stuff ain't bad by the way right like the actual like fight scenes um well we'll get into like who those involve but those are actually pretty well done oh Uh, dude they're badass there's there's some great great stuff yeah i i have more to say about this but but at this point in the movie we see Harry in the modern day. This is the white guy with the mustache and he's practicing his ninja moves in his apartment by cutting up watermelon. It's not exactly the toughest stuff in the world. Uh, we also this get to see like scene, later. One of my favorite scenes, by the way, people, this is one of my favorite visuals is him with the watermelon. It's like so damn serious. Everything it's a in what the-, the fuck moment. It's awesome. You know, we told, talked about how the different tones are, even though crazy stuff happens with the ninjas in terms of supernatural stuff, Richard Harrison is playing this like deathly seriously. Yes. Every scene he's in, he is stone cold serious. He looks angry. He looks ready for revenge. You know, he's the revenge for a ninja guy. He's right. mad at that watermelon and he's not <laughs> going to let it show him who's boss. He's and, not messing around, man. And, and Baron, the other white guy, also like pointless footage of him spinning some sort of like fire sticks. That's his yes. training. Yeah. In other words, but, but this was probably easy because it was basically just them playing with a thing as compared to having to choreograph a fight scene. Right. And especially learning the director's technique, man, it's like, who knows where some of this footage is from? Who who right. knows like how many different things he's like, Oh, we have a ninja twirling, flaming chains that looks like something out of burning man put that in the ninja training sequence right here right cut this into this cut the and, and it's like that explains the whole experience when you watch the movie when you know the directors how the movie's made otherwise you know? you're just confused why things like this happen the, the next scene is harry at his apartment gets a phone call on yes. his garfield phone yes which i'll explain the movie doesn't he gets a call from a guy named Jaguar Wong. And Jaguar Wong, folks, is the guy that we see in most of this movie. Jaguar Wong does everything, but supposedly is a henchman for Harry. Right. Because that's from the other movie. It's, Harry and Jaguar never meet. Yes. It, dude, it's it's Jaguar's movie, basically. It and, is. and he's great. He's awesome on screen. He kicks tons of ass. He does. But he's not a ninja i mean he he's uh it's just the like guy you said he's he's a henchman of of harry's or he's working for harry yeah um and so i was like this is so weird because like i say richard harrison as as harry plays everything seriously and he's taking a phone call from jaguar wong about you know these evil ninjas are looking for you know the statue and he's on a garfield phone <laughs> nobody addresses the Garfield phone. The Garfield phone is not p- played for laughs. The Garfield phone just happens to be the phone that Harry has. It is absurd. It is so absurd. Yeah. But apparently I read up like, and Godfrey Ho intentionally wanted this movie to be made for the American audience. He had heard that Garfield was tremendously popular in America. So he thought all you have to do, put an American thing in there. Wow. He didn't understand that it was absolutely ridiculous for like, you know, a tough action guy to be talking on a Garfield phone. Yes, it's preposterous. It sticks out like a sore thumb. I mean, dude, the Garfield phone in this movie is the equivalent of Michael's dino jammies oh, yeah. in Don't Panic. Oh, yeah. Where when you talk about the movie, you're like, oh, the ninja movie with the Garfield phone? Oh, it I know It overrides that all of my memories. All I can think about is this guy. This guy just taking a call on his Garfield phone. Yeah. Even it's though incredible. it's like a pretty brief scene here. Yeah. There's so <laughs> many little subplots at this point. It's it's probably not worth talking about all of these, but you know, Jaguar Wong is basically tasked with talking to 
Machiko to try to find a, a, a piece of the, um, the puzzle. And he's constantly getting into fights with just thugs, not ninjas, but thugs that work for either Baron or the Supreme Ninja Empire. Yeah. Good fight scenes. I would argue that the stakes are undercut because we're told from the beginning that this is a henchman. Even though this is the character we mostly see on screen, he's not the main character. And he's doing sort of like a task that isn't important enough for the main character to do. Mm -hmm. So it just always sort of feels pointless, these fights. Yeah. They, they feel so unimportant to the story, to moving it forward. Yeah. It's, it's just stuff that happens. Jaguar is awesome, but you're right because it's like anytime he shows up on screen, wherever he goes to ask questions or investigate or whatever, there are thugs that magically appear to fight him. There's like he it, fights three guys that are playing catch on the street. And after he just beats their ass, he's like, where's this restaurant? And they're like, it's right there. And it's like yeah. right next to them. Yeah. He goes Dude, to he get goes his car and a guy that's like cleaning cars just starts fighting him. Yes. Dude, my favorite is he goes to the pawn shop to try and pawn off the yeah. ring. And later in a later scene, the pawn shop owner goes after him and they fight. Yeah. Which it's obviously amazing. must have been something in the original movie, but is not addressed at all in this one. Yeah. It's <laughs> so much of this movie, just to be clear, is Jaguar Wong. And he's like meeting up with this girl, Lily, that he used to date, that dates a guy named Victor who works for Tiger, who works for Baron. Like it's so many levels down. <laughs> yeah. It's so many levels down. There's a guy named like Karata that works for the Supreme Ninja Master that's going around. And he tries to set up Baron and Harry against one another since they each have a component by throwing res he's respectively there's two scenes in a row where this evil ninja sneaks into a, a normal apartment building and like attacks the guy both right. times by the way it's kind of hilarious Harry and Baron both sort of vanish and then appear as ninjas it's incredible it's amazing but the important element is that he throws a ninja star at them and then leaves and it's the other guy's ninja star. So he's trying yes. to like set them at odds, but they kind of figure out right away. They're like, Hey, you have my ninja star and you have my ninja star. The only guy that would have both is uh Yamato from the Supreme yep. Ninja. Clan. They figure it out right. right away. It's incredible. You want the golden ninja warrior all for yourself. Look at this. Yes. That's my ninja star. <laughs> this is yours. There's only one person who has our ninja stars. You mean Yamato? He's coming after us. He may have got the body of the golden ninja warrior from Tamashi. There are so many little subplots, folks. Jaguar has a sex scene with Lily. And then later, Lily has a sex scene again with Victor. We get, we get yes. both. And, and the sex scene with Victor especially feels out of place just because these are like supporting, supporting villains. They're like way down the chain and we get like a full sex scene with them. Yeah. Dude. Everything feels like it's designed to eat up screen time. Yeah, for sure. On this one. And and dude, speaking of screen time, what about the incredible um, Harry asks his girlfriend what's for dinner scene with Early the, drunken, on, and with she the drops, drunken crabs? She's like, I'm making drunken crab. She screams. She's dropped the crabs all over the floor and is scared. And Harry just like pulls out a ninja knife and throws it. And, and we're shown that it's like stuck in a crab. Who's like wiggling around. I was like, I hope they didn't hurt that poor crab. That would be yeah. inhumane. I assume not, but uh, who knows? It, it's Hong Kong. <laughs> There, there are fun scenes in this, even if it's not the point of the movie. That that evil ninja that's sneaking around in the apartments, there's a hilarious scene, I'll give Jamie the time codes for this, where he's doing cartwheels and teleporting to get into the building. Teleporting, yeah. little teleporting. Amazing. And then a, 
a somersault down some stairs for no reason. Yeah. Like nobody's there. He just like sort of puts his hands down and does this little somersault down the last couple steps. That, it's adorable. That's what ninjas do. That's what ninjas that's do. That's what ninjas they're all, do. They're always moving. Um, one thing I do want to address before we forget is what are your thoughts on the messenger robot toy? That's exactly what I was getting to, fortunately, okay. Jim. Okay. Is this is another standout thing about the movie for me. So strange. Harry hears something at his apartment. Obviously, you can tell Harry spends most of his scenes at the apartment. I, I swear, Richard Harrison must have only had like two days to like do all of this. Yes. Like, just nothing. He opens the door and this knockoff Transformer toy looks basically like a kit bashed Omega Supreme, if anybody remembers that. Mm. Walks mm -hmm. in and says, <laughs> you have three days to reform the Ninja Empire. And, uh, and that's when... Or, or you have three days to return. You have three days yeah. to return, like, you know, the statue. And that's when Harry makes his second call on the phone and tells Jaguar, I have to reform the Ninja Empire. Great. Listen, you have just three days to return the Golden Ninja Warrior to our master. Hear and obey. Listen to me. Trader, I believe that you've received the death message from our Ninja Empire. Ninja is supreme and you have double-crossed it. Why did you do that? The Ninja Empire is evil. I have to reform the Ninja Empire. Greatest line of the movie. And also, dude, visually, I don't know if you noticed, but Harry's holding the receiver like here. It's not at his head. It's like... <laughs> We're going to do it like this. Yeah. Maybe it was dirty or something. He didn't want to get like that on his ear. Good point. It's like, that's not how you use a phone. Come on, people. Thank you to my friend, Matt, for, for lending me this. This is hilarious. Thank you, Matt. How did he have that phone? Is that an His old, wife that... got it for him sort of as a gag gift because he had one as a kid. Oh, my God. I think awesome. I did, too, to be honest. I think I had that phone when I was a little kid. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And, and later, by the way, that same robot, or at least one that's just like it, also comes to Baron's house uh, carrying a VHS tape. Uh, yes, th there, are, there are. See, because the characters in the Hong Kong footage can't physically interact with the main characters in the South Korean footage, they're either doing phone calls or they get videotapes that are showing footage from the movie so that exactly. they know what's going on. Like when Machiko gets kidnapped, kidnapped, our heroes only know about it via these cassette tapes that are delivered to their home by this magical toy robot. Yes. Yes. It, it, <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. It's adorable and hilarious and bizarre. Yeah. yeah. But they treat it serious. They treat it like somehow this robot was able to be, you know, like remote controlled delivered to a high rise apartment buildings and, and the backyard of, you know, uh, Baron's criminal empire. It, 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 it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. There's a lot going on with Jaguar where, you know, he's getting betrayed by Lily uh, to, and, and he gets, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, tied up by the bad guys, by Victor and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. His escape was hilarious because it's so obvious. He's tied up to a chair and he asks a henchman for um, a cigarette. Henchman tries to give him his own cigarette. No, I don't smoke that brand. Get one from my bag. Henchman doesn't question that. He's like, okay, get, get one from your bag. He's like, you know, can you light it for me and get it all set? Okay. Yeah. Give it to me. And then he like throws like what it, it like shoots. It shoots the bad guy or something like that. It was a, it was yeah. a trick cigarette. Trick cigarette. And, and, and then, and, and it took forever to set that up. I was like, why yeah. are you giving him all these favors? Yes. It's, it's, awesome but it's like oh what a great 
weird excuse on how to get out of this uh, predicament, you know. It was a little. And it's cool. It's cool too to see him. Jaguar's a badass fighter, and it's cool to see him use the chair that he's tied to as an actual weapon to take out the henchmen. It's, it's kind been. of a Jackie Chan kind of thing, you know. And uh, there's some innovative stuff in this as far as like the action and the fights go. Eventually, Michiko is still kidnapped and, and stuff. And um, Harry again uses his phone to call Jaguar and tells him, kidnap Lily because Lily's dating Victor and, and, and we'll do a swap. We're going to we're going to oh, right. we're going to do an exchange. They go to a rock quarry. Uh, by the way, there are definitely no rock quarries in Hong Kong. It's <laughs> way too small of an island to have rock quarries. But yeah. whatever, they go to a rock quarry to do the exchange. But Machiko is actually just like a bad guy wearing like a headdress and sunglasses. Yes. Yeah. That cracked me up. That was awesome. It, they didn't bring Machiko, okay? Jaguar has to save Machiko. Well, we know, you know, he can fight off these thugs and he does that. But, but, but Michiko has been tied, we're told, to a time bomb. Mm, mm -hmm. Somehow, Jaguar knows just where to drive. He drives to the building yeah. and is able to defuse the bomb just in time. I bet that made more sense in the original movie. Because Definitely in this one, not. he just beats the bad guys up, drives straight to a location, defuses it. No explanation no. for how he can do that, but the movie, it had to happen for the movie. So it had to happen for the movie. And <laughs> now we're moving into the end game, both for like Jaguar, Harry, and Baron. Harry gets a note that there is going to be a challenge at Devil's Rock. Baron gets a VHS tape by Toy Robot, <laughs> which actually yep. doesn't makes sense but i think it's just a, a limit of the footage that they had because his footage is all about like ninjas having honor and harikari and this that and the other it's, yeah it's, it's very pointless yeah was harry's note was that one that was on the windshield of his car when him and his woman step out of before, that no that was upper... before it was just telling him two days left to till the um that's right and then he finally that's gets right. a note like it's time for the challenge or something like that you know they're gonna that's they right. Need, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, There's a lot going on in this flick, dude. There's a too lot. Many characters, of, too many characters and yeah. too many characters that never interact. So I'm not trying to explain it all. You can watch this and it keeps moving. Even if you watch it, it's going to be confusing. It's yeah. gonna, The relationships are very confusing. A lot of the characters are barely on screen. Uh, the Supreme Ninja, we only see in that opening sequence. And then he just mm -hmm. has like, you know, guys like, Karada and Yamato supposedly working for him, but we barely see those guys either. Right. The Hong Kong footage is a very small portion of this movie, even though that's what drives the story. Yep. Yeah. What's important is, <laughs> by the way, uh, Harry's note like is, is um, saying, give back our idol and I am the Ninja Terminator. Ah, yes. We get the line, yeah. like right with yeah. like about 10 minutes left in the movie. We yeah. get the line that the bad guy says he's the Ninja Terminator. And I am the Ninja Terminator. There it is. Harry and Baron go to like fight at Devil's Rock while um, Jaguar goes for a final showdown with Tiger Wong, who does mm -hmm. take off that blonde wig. Yep. Which made me wonder why he was wearing it in the first place. But they're tre <laughs> that's treated sort of like in the last movie. We had the suiting up scene. Completely. The equivalent here is just that Tiger Wong takes off his wig and now he's way more serious. And, and his and his outfit. He reveals he like <laughs> he reveals like his black like battle outfit underneath, which is not like armor or an out it's just street clothes, basically. But yeah, it's it's this moment of transformation where you're like Oh, I guess he's in like badass fight mode now, but I it guess isn't really he leveled up. dramatic or I, it's, I don't know. it's a great fight scene. It's the best fight scene yeah. in the movie, but it doesn't matter because we're not told that Jaguar is fighting to save anybody's life or anything like that at this point, really. Yeah. They fight on these steps. They fight on this beach. It's a long fight scene. It's over five minutes long. 
And it's well done for what it is. It's just mm-hmm. that it doesn't really matter. Not really. It. I, I did like the final bit of it because Tiger Wong tries to sort of um, like jump up and stomp uh, a Jaguar and he gets stuck in the beach sand, like up to about his waist. And he still does a decent job fighting him off. But I thought that that was fairly inventive for what it was. Me too. It was awesome. It's cool too, man, because like as you're as they're fighting when he's stuck in the sand, almost like a quicksand thing. Yeah. Jaguar, it's not even a big deal, but Jaguar like cracks him in the head. And that winds up, winds up being kind of like the killing blow because yeah. he gets cracked in the head and Tiger still kind of makes a move after that. But then he just sort of slumps over and it's like, oh, okay, so Jaguar dealt him like the death blow. It and just took a minute to, to finish. That's him the off. end of that, you know, but it's cool. I, I, I dug that. It's, it's just that then, so we've gotten a good fight scene and then it sort of undercuts the final ninja fight because Harry and Baron and I don't know whether it was Yamato or Karata. I think it was Yamada. Yamada is like the evil ninja that works for the ninja empire. The three mm-hmm. of them are all going to have a big fight scene. And like I say, the fight scene with Jaguar and Tiger Lee, little over five minutes. This one, the final battle with these three important guys under three minutes. It's a yeah. quick fight scene. Yeah. And 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 the, the ninjas are teleporting and stuff like that. They're doing crazy stuff. They're they're shooting like gas out of their swords, and it, it, I mean, yeah. there's some inventive stuff, but it is quick. They, Chris, they trained under uh, Homeboy from Revenge of the Ninja. <laughs> they trained under um, Baron. Baron. No, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Braden. Braden. Bra- Braden. I'm sorry. Braden yeah. with all his tricks. Um, yes, they've got like the prop weapons and and uh, smoke and flamethrowers and whatever you need. It happens really fast, you know, and I, I, I guess Baron gets killed. I don't really remember that, but it, it, it gets down to Harry versus y- Yamada, which is fine. Chris, real quick, the Braden kill is Baron. so quick. Baron, I'm sorry, is so quick and disappointing because I can't even Homeboy, remember. Homeboy has the three claws hidden in his, like, right. elbow, his elbow, and he, and he just kind of reaches back. And that's and, it. And you're right. And and he gets it in the in the neck. And, and it's not like there's big spurts of blood, but you're no, right. No. He just slumps dead. It's very anticlimactic. And, and it's like, oh well, he's he's gone. He's done. Yeah. In in like pro wrestling, if your finishing move was just doing like one of these, the, the audience would would tear you apart. It, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Harry essentially beats Yamada without killing him. And then Yamada seems to like sort of like will himself to explode. Mm -hmm. And then it just says (laughs) the end. No credits. It just ends. Yeah, Yeah. it's incredible. There's no denouement. Harry doesn't like reunite with his wife or like secure no. the ninja statue somewhere safe or anything. Just in the background, like Harry's in the foreground, Yamato in the background explodes the end. I was like, what? It's amazing. <laughs> that is it's, the most abrupt ending yeah. I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, it's wild. It, we are done. <laughs> yeah. Harry, so, but Harry does put the three pieces together and we and we as an audience we assume we know like okay well now he's the grand master ninja or whatever the ninja supreme Except then they made a secret but right sort of but but dude holy shit yeah this is like okay we're done we're we're over we're we're this is not this even any closing over. credits like no music no nothing it just ends <laughs> like we did de- we yeah. get like there's not even like the end against a black screen. They, they, they put the end up on screen while Harry is there and Yamato's smoke is like, you know, just still exploding. And it's just the end. Boom. That's a great point. Yeah. It is this, stunning. Th- this movie, though, it makes me curious to check out more Godfrey Ho productions. But at the same time, it's like. This is a specific type of fun, bad yeah. movie to watch where 
I say this every episode, but if you're with friends and you're having a good time, it's awesome to have it on and you can laugh at it. But if you're trying to get a story and hang out alone at night and relax and watch a movie like this is this is uh, this is like a psychedelic experience almost watching this flick for the first time god you know what it's like i would even argue that some of the martial arts fights that jaguar wong has might be more technically impressive than some in revenge of the ninja but i Mm -hmm. don't care about them because the character we're always told is just a henchman He's not driving the story forward, the story that we're told. So this right. movie is is a very strange, surreal experience, like Jim said. It's it's fun and funny, like unintentionally funny, but you're not going to get the same satisfaction that you do from a movie like Revenge of the Ninja had a story and had definable characters. Yeah. If you ask me to define who is Harry McQueen, this ninja badass, I'd be like, I don't know. I mean, I know he's got a girlfriend and a henchman. Mm-hmm. I know he owns a Garfield phone. I couldn't really tell you too much <laughs> about his personality. I can tell you things yeah. that he owns. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the Revenge of the Ninja, it feels like a real movie. I mean, it, it it's, a B, it's a B movie, and it does have some cheesiness and some bad acting, but it's an actual, when you watch it, you get a beginning, middle of an end, and you get a yeah. cohesive experience for the most part. I, I think it like makes you look at these sort of um, schlocky movies and realize that there's there's B movies and then there's cheap exploitation cinema. Good point. B movie is still usually going to have you know some professionalism to it, even if it's like sort of a, a cheesy story or something like that, you know, or or a lower budget. But that stuff, it, it still works as, as, a, as a story. Uh, the exploitation, it, it was just crazy. Like, I, I, I bet that they made money because Godfrey Hope made dozens upon yep. dozens of these, all with the word ninja in them, many of them with Richard Harrison. Apparently, what they would do is he would film something like four or five of them at a time over just I a couple days. Yeah. I could see that. Was this guy like the um, a, a, a different version of like Russ Meyer, overseas Russ Meyer type mm, style of just maybe. like get as many productions going at once as you can, right. swap footage in between flicks, whatever makes it work as a package that we can sell. Yeah, it's not really the quality. We're go- we're going for quantity here, and like you said, man, it, at this time the trend, the red hot trend of, of ninjas it's like pop ninja in the title put a ninja on the cover of the vhs mm-hmm. we're good to go we'll, we'll make some money and you know what it was a different time you and i grew up in that where if you know we didn't have an internet to look up several reviews of something at once if we were curious like should we trust this we had to just sort of roll the dice like jaguar wong does in a few scenes pointlessly uh, yes. he rolls a die, not even dice. dice. He just yeah. rolls yeah. a die here and there for some reason. Um, yeah. we'd go to a video store and the cover art would catch your eye and you'd read the back and go, maybe that sounds interesting. Maybe not. It was such a roll of the dice back then. It was probably a lot easier to make some of this exploitation cinema. Mm-hmm. Because all Christmas. you had to do was sell it to the, the video store, you, you know, not even sell it to like the end consumer in a, in, in a movie theater. Yes. Cause the video store is actually your customer. Right. For, for something like um, that. And, and, and just two years difference, just two years difference, but uh, revenge of the ninja is, you know, a theatrically released movie. Ninja Terminator is pretty clearly designed for the VHS market, the burgeoning yeah. VHS market. Um, Definitely. Before we go, Chris, I wanted to throw out a dream scenario for you going back to the time of like 1983 84 right. revenge of the ninja All right. comes out say canon films gets the rights to gi joe from hasbro oh, at this same time right after revenge of the ninja yeah they make a storm shadow and snake eyes movie totally. show Kazugi stars as storm shadow. Yes. Michael Dudikoff, the American Ninja as snake eyes because snake eyes was a white dude. Correct. He is. He is. So, canonically, so, uh, although he, uh, he before, usually doesn't before, talk before you 
slap me and unfriend me for saying Michael Dudikoff. The only reason I recommend him in 1984 era is who else would play the role you don't necessarily have to take his mask off you could just get somebody like michael bean to do flashback scenes in vietnam yes hire michael bean for one day that's kind of my point is like snake eyes has got the mask on anyway but that was just a weird thing it's not a bad idea show because storm shadow is would have been really cool at that point in time yeah at that era yeah yeah so like v year that um, storm shadow um, came out (laughs) <laughs> and script script by uh, Larry Hama, of course. Oh, of course. So. Even today, that's what I'd want. Let me ask you yeah. this. You had the idea for like a ninja theme, and I'm so glad you did because I did have fun with both of these. Do you have a favorite ninja movie? Because I can think of one that I like a lot. You know, Revenge of the Ninja is is at the top of my list. Just okay. be, And a lot of it is, I do have to admit, a lot of it is based on nostalgia because that's this- fair fueled my imagination and my love of everything ninja as a kid um i would also highly recommend ninja 3 the domination directed by the same guy who did revenge just because it's so funny and bizarre i, I and, almost and has had Joe Kazugi in it yeah i almost selected that as mine but i didn't think we needed to do two show kasugi movies back to back uh but but maybe someday we will look at that yeah. one because it, it's more bonkers it's weirder it's, it's yeah. I would say if it counts, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if it counts. Yeah, hey, I feel you. The yeah. 1991. Those are they're ninjas. Still, they still fight a classic, they man. fight ninjas all the fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's that'll be my choice. This was fun. I don't know like necessarily what we'll come up with for a theme next. Maybe we won't have a theme, but um I I, I had a great time. I I sincerely did. Thank you so much for like bringing me back to something I had not really watched in in several years was ninja movies. Oh man, my pleasure. This was an awesome one. And and I think it's a cool idea to introduce themes whenever we want them to, to the show. But I also think it's cool to have the old standby of like, well, yeah, we've got thousands of different schlocky horror movies to watch we really this was just a this was just a quick little break in our road in our journey of like schlocky horror this was just a fun i agree i think that there should be a like there will always be a lot of horror but every once in a while maybe we'll do like you know knockoff post-apocalyptic movies or or giant monsters like that are not godzilla you know things like that there are things that we could get into here and there definitely Um, alien movies there, there's some good like alien horror movies oh yeah what yeah. do you want to plug yeah guys uh check out my links below to my website jimbafood.com and social media you can score books prints etc uh shout out to fabulous jazzy jamie wood for edits and production we also have the pop-up book with which chris is grabbing for me right now these- yeah, that's available at propositionpress.com, my buddy who engineered and manufactured the book. So These check that out. Folks. And you've got a new Thanks, um, ballpoint sketchbook, right? Yes. I need to send you one of these, dude. I'll get your address when we're off the air. And then, uh, folks, I mean, on this channel, every Monday I do a live stream, usually have an interview, but always recap the comic book news and comics that have come out. And then I've got my channel, Comic Tropes, where I do more edited uh, deep dive analysis videos about comics, because I kind of like comic books. Me Um, too. Got any conventions uh, scheduled for the summer yet, Jim? Or is that still far away? Yeah, I just confirmed uh, Heroes Con. Um, that'll be in June. That's my next appearance. And then I'm also doing Dragon Con last weekend of August going into September. You know, it's always that Labor Beautiful. Day weekend. Yep. So um, those Very are the nice. two I have I have coming up. Um, so. Yeah, uh, I'm not like tabling at any, but I'm, I'm definitely planning on going to New York Comic Con uh, in the fall. Do you think that there's any chance you'll do the... Um, uh, Lake Como uh, festival again? Uh, not, this year, not this year, but um, I am that doing thing looks incredible. It's so good, dude. Um, I'm trying to get back for next year. And then I'll also be in New York in October. Cause that's, I do New York every year, man. That's always my best show. And I know you have a million things to do. Cause like that, that becomes a networking event. But if there was time, maybe we, we should like try to do something in person. Oh. 
I don't know what we could do yet, but that, 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 that's still several months off. Just something that we'll put in the back of our heads. That would be awesome, man. We have a lot of time to figure something out. Exactly. Something to think about. I had a great time, Jim. Me too. You guys, thanks for joining us and leave your comments below, please. Hit like and subscribe and hit that bell uh, thing for notifications. And otherwise, just uh, keep crashing it up. Bye. Trash Movie Bonanza. Like and subscribe.